Um, we'd like to welcome Paul Rober from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, so uh, Paul is wears many hats <laughs> at Milwaukee. He's a distinguished professor. He's also an associate dean of academic affairs for the School of Freshwater Sciences. And um, let's see. And also the director of innovative weather. So. Paul's very busy, and we're lucky to have him here this week. Um, just a little bit. So uh, Paul is here visiting us through the DTC Visitor Program, um, and so he's working on. He's going to talk to us today about um, aspects of the project that he's going to be working on, which is this um, using evolutionary programming with respect to ensembles. So um, I know a number of you in the room have already met with Paul while he was here. He is here through Friday. He doesn't fly back until Saturday. So um, if anybody hasn't gotten to talk to him, wants to talk to him, let me know or talk to Paul afterwards. He is going to be visiting Noah part of tomorrow, but um, then he's got some other time available. And then Paul will be visiting through the DTC Visitor Program. He will be visiting the Environmental Modeling Center a little bit later in his project, and he'll be coming back to visit us again towards the end of his project. So this is just the, the start. So I will turn it over to Paul, and he can um, tell you about his project. Thanks, Louisa. So I'm uh, really excited to be here to talk to you about um, the new old idea of evolutionary programming. And I say um, new old because it starts with Charles Darwin, of course, as it must with evolution. And um, the interesting thing about this quote, I think, is it really nicely summarizes, at least conceptually, what the idea is all about. Except for one very slight difference, in nature, evolution doesn't really care if things get better. It just cares that things survive. It's really about survival of the species. And we're trying to drive solutions to something that's actually a better solution. So our metric of success is different. But otherwise, it's really quite similar. And this idea has actually been around for quite a number of years. The 1960s are the first references to it that I could find. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very general concept. The idea is really starting from a computer program that writes other computer programs. And essentially, it manages the evolution of those programs to better and better solutions. And really, all you need is a well-defined problem. So for example, in the weather domain, that might be <coughs> forecasting precipitation, or it might be forecasting temperature. Uh, then you need a measure of success or equivalently fitness. So root mean square error or Breyer skill score are, are two reasonable measures that I'm using to evaluate the success of individual algorithms. And the solutions are, are then constructed by performing uh, a sequence of mathematical operations. And there's a variety of kinds of operations that you can use. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Now I've applied this uh, concept already to generalize chaotic data sets from various forms of Lorenz equations uh, to actual minimum and maximum temperature data to 500 millibar height anomaly data and to wind power data and most recently to heavy rainfall. And my DTC project really is about the heavy rainfall forecasting question. Um, so it's, it seems to work everywhere except there are people who are a little unclear on the concept of evolution. <laughs> now, Colorado, as it turns out, is sort of sitting on the fence. They want to know about it, but they don't really want to know about it. Now, Wisconsin, on the other hand, we've abandoned the search for truth, so we actually just have our fingers in our ears and we don't want to hear about it, so that's where we are. So aside from the political headwinds, um, we can do things with this. You can use it regardless of what people think about it. I should add, by the way, that no one has ever pushed back at me about this idea of using it for weather forecasting. I haven't had any objections to that so far. Um, <clears throat> I first became familiar with this uh, in noticing a paper that was written by Danny Hillis in 1990 in which he applied the concept to an efficient sorting of a set of random numbers. And his uh, measure of success was the least number of steps to get those numbers in the right order. And he showed that writing a computer program that wrote other computer programs to do this uh, was about as efficient as the best computer programmers. And another interesting thing that he found out about this was that um, the solutions were not always easily understandable by him. So he couldn't necessarily follow the logic. 
So there was a good part and a bad part. So to some extent, the algorithms that he was devising were sort of a black box. And I didn't want to allow that to happen, but conceptually, I liked the idea because it reminded me exactly of consensus forecasting. So you're in a room with a bunch of forecasters. They're all looking at the same data, but they're bringing their own individual levels of experience and training and uh, background to the problem. And they come up with independent forecasts, and the signal emerges out of the consensus forecast from that group of individuals. It's a very highly skillful forecast. And I thought this method could be applied in the same way to produce ensemble forecasting that would be very skillful in the ensemble mean sense, but also provide good probabilistic information. So that was kind of the idea that I started with. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Hillis found solutions that were kind of a black box, and I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to understand the forecast logic. And I have uh, a fair amount of background in weather forecasting, and so I, basically the logic often looks like uh, you have sort of a baseline forecast based on looking at the various components. It might be weather maps, it might be individual measurements. You put together kind of a baseline forecast, and then you start tweaking it. You have if-then kinds of considerations. I'm going to modify it according to this condition. So for example, if you're forecasting minimum temperature, and you have a baseline understanding of what the, the air mass characteristics are, but you know that there's a fresh snow cover, then you're probably going to modify that forecast downward unless there's a lot of wind and cloud and other things that modify it. So this structure that I devise is a, is a sequence of 10 if-then statements, which can also be always invoked or never invoked, which means if it's always invoked, that it's a baseline forecast. If it's never invoked, it just gets zeroed out. So you might not need 10 lines. You might have an algorithmic solution that only has three lines or four lines. And that's completely possible for the algorithms to develop in that way if that's the most optimal form for it. So the idea is to have a set of uh, potential predictors, and you use your uh, weather domain expertise to define what those potential predictors are. You don't want to throw everything including the kitchen sink into it because the search space uh, grows very quickly and you only have a finite amount of data in which to train and test, especially the training part requires data. And so the more information you put into it at that initial stage, the more training data you need to provide uh, the possibility of finding the correct solution. So you're essentially diverting it from its true purpose, which is to find the really good signature. So you have to have some sense of what are going to be good predictors. But you don't have to know exactly the set, nor do you need to know exactly the combination that they can put, be put together in the form, nor the weighting of them. All of that is, is devised by the, the evolutionary process. One of the variables that I always put in is the number one. And the reason I do that is because uh, I normalize all the variables based on the minimum and maximum of the uh, training data set, so it ranges from 0 to 1. So 1 is the maximum that anything can ever reach. And that means that an if-then statement can say, if variable x is greater than 1, then do such and such. But it will never be greater than 1, which means that uh, line would never be executed. So you can have, it, have the ability of actually crossing out particular possibilities. And that's important, because you don't necessarily need 10 lines of information. Maybe three lines will do. Uh, and also, conversely, you can have if variable x is less than or equal to 1. Well, it's always going to be true. It's always going to be less than or equal to 1. So that becomes a baseline forecast. And that's always going to be part of whatever your forecast is. So the solutions finally end up looking like um, um, multiple linear regression or nonlinear regression equations. They can have up to cubic variables. But quite often, they are linear. And then they have a series of if-then modifiers beyond that sort of baseline forecast. So that's kind of the structure that they look like. And so we have these variables as inputs. We have the relation, relational operators that I spoke about. Uh, the um, mathematical operations that we use are very simple. Multiplication and addition. And in addition, we have variable coefficients, which can be positive or negative. So basically, you get multiplication, addition, and subtraction. And that's it. And I kept it that way intentionally. You don't have to. You can use very complicated forms. You can use transcendental functions. You can use logarithms, if you like. But you're going to quickly go into an area where you're not going to be able to understand what the logic of the forecast really is if you go too far with that. So I, I kept that out of it. And I found, again, because of you know the success of forecasting systems like MOSS, it's not, for the most part, needed to do that kind of thing. I did do some experiments with some more complicated forms, and I found that it didn't really add additional predictive value. So 
So at least for the weather forecast that I've looked at so far, that hasn't been necessary. So there are up to 10 lines of this form, which means the genome can have, uh, with 11 elements, can have up to 110 pieces to it, of which not all algorithms will have all of those pieces. So how does this work? It starts by seeding the process. So at the very, when you first switch it on, you start with some population uh, of anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 initially randomly constructed algorithms. Usually I work with 10,000. I'm trying one of the experiments I'm doing at DTC is to see what happens if you drastically increase that sort of carrying population. If you want to think about this in ecological terms, you might say that if I'm starting with 10,000, that's the absolute maximum population that the ecology can support. It will never be above 10,000. It will quite often be quite a few less than that. So we're generating ensembles that might have members that are well performing of several thousand members. So not fully 10,000, but several thousand is quite common. Uh, and one of the issues that's come up is diversity in the solution. So for example, if I increase from 10,000 to 500,000 or a million algorithms, do I increase the diversity of the solution population? My guess is it probably will increase. We know from evolutionary biology that that is the case, that larger populations tend to be more diverse. So there's reason to believe that this would also work here, but I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm doing that experiment as we speak, in fact. Um, <clears throat> so we start with that initial process. Let's say it's 10,000 algorithms. Probably 9,900 of them are absolutely terrible, because again, it's completely random. So the combinations don't work most of the time. Uh, but maybe 100 of them are OK. And some of them are really good, even from the very beginning. You just got lucky, and you got a few that are really good. And so the idea is then to evaluate the performance at that step, and then cull the population. Only allow certain members of that population to proceed and pass their information down to the next generation. And this occurs in a repeated process as you gradually tighten the selection pressure. So each step that you go through, each generation means that next generation has to perform a little bit better than the one previously for it to pass its information down. So you do that. Turns out, one of the questions I had when I started this was how many iterations, how many generations do you need to get good solutions? And I was pretty shocked to discover you don't need very many. Probably within about 20 to 30 generations, you're getting very good forecasts. And another 50 to 100, you're getting outstanding forecasts. And it's, it kind of plateaus, as you might expect. You get the biggest growth at the early stages, the first 20 or 30 steps. And after that, it begins to sort of plateau out. And so you need some proper stopping uh, procedure so that you're not overtraining the data. I use cross-validation for that. And it seems to work without overfitting the data pretty well. <clears throat> so that's kind of the basic process. One of the uh, key issues, of course, we're talking about optimizing solutions. So if you imagine the solution space and the fitness of those solutions as being a topographical surface, as in this image, uh, obviously it's higher dimensional than this. This is only kind of two, two directions, and any real problem has multi-dimensions. So you can't actually, actually visualize it, but if you just imagine for simplicity it looks like this, then the fitness landscape tends to be complex. And so you'll have areas where you have global maxima, and that's what you're really trying to search for. So if you're looking, what you want to be is up here. That's what you're hoping the selection pressure is going to do. Unfortunately, because it is complicated, you may end up here. And your population may be very happy to just to sit around on this little plateau and not go anywhere else and just kind of stop at that point. So you have to find ways to kind of push it up the hill to keep it going. And so one of the ways that I found it's very effective in doing this is actually a simulated sexual uh, selection pressure. So initially, I started this with asexual uh, selection. And I found that it, that it uh, wasn't effective as sexual selection in terms of driving populations very quickly to uh, better solutions. And I, I uh, was interested to discover when I was looking through some of the evolutionary biology papers that this structure looks very much like guerrilla society. <laughs> so our weather forecast problems are kind of a, you know, an ape problem. So that's what we're dealing with. So um, one of the drawbacks of doing this is because it is propagating good information very quickly, it's easy 
for a smaller set of genes to actually dominate the population. So even though those are good solutions, they're not very diverse. They tend to be a lot alike each other if you drive this too hard. So you need something to actually pull it back from that. And that, as it happens, is the trade-off of a sexual selection, which is disease. Uh, disease actually is a control on this, and the way I implement it to reduce these genetic bottlenecks is to um, select at random any one line or any one gene from the entire population of 10,000 algorithms and say any algorithm that has that gene in it is wiped out. So I just wipe them all out if they have that. And so naturally what happens is if you have a very common gene, that's more likely to be selected. And that means that those algorithms are wiped out. And yes, you do lose some good information when you do that, but you also open up the space for other solutions to emerge. So it drives it off that comfortable plateau and forces it to actually find different solutions. And it will find its way up the slope by doing that. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy that that works the way it does. One other issue that, that comes up is how to introduce innovation in the solutions. And it turns out that mutations are really important in that, uh, in that uh, desire to do that. And what this graph shows is root mean square error versus uh, four different types of mutations that I use. Three of them are just random mutations to coefficients, variables, uh, and operators. And the fourth one is what's called the transposition error or copy error. It basically means you take a piece of a gene and you apply it to another gene, but you mis misapply it. So it's phase misaligned so that essentially you're, you're mixing up the data. And by doing that, you actually get new combinations. Now, as you might expect, often mutations are very dangerous, very harmful. Most of the solutions when you do that actually get worse, especially at the later stages when you've already saturated or pretty close to saturated what the best solutions are. But in the early stages especially, the early and middle stages, you'll find you'll uh, encounter a few new approaches that are actually much better than anything else that's out there. And those then begin to pass down that information to subsequent generations. And that becomes more of a mechanism for making the forecast than previously. So if you don't have that mutation component, you can't introduce that new information. So it turns out that that's very important. Uh, another thing that I wanted to do is to try to maintain diversity. As I mentioned before, uh, even with the disease, the sexual selection process really propagates uh, the set of genes rapidly through the population. And so one way to control that again is to think about uh, Charles Darwin's experience with the Galapagos Islands. So you may remember him talking about the finches on the Galapagos Islands and they had different beak structures depending on which island they actually lived on. And they were quite distinct from one island to the next. So this is sort of a niche development idea. So I said, okay, I'm going to split up my 10,000 population into 20 different ecological niches. So 500 members initially in each niche and just let it go from that point on. And each one has a different set of inputs that are available to them. So food sources, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, and they also have susceptibility to different kinds of disease. In the, in the most severe form, it's, it's automatic death. But for others, it may just force a mutation. And some others, it doesn't have any disease at all. And also different mating practices, so so a number of partners, number of children that are produced, uh, selections of mate within that that niche or outside that niche, and whether or not they have to have qualifying characteristics in terms of mean square error criteria to be able to to uh, reproduce. So all of those are factors that are different in the different niches that allows them to develop more unique solutions within each niche. And there's still a lot of cross. Uh, information exchange across some of these niches, so it's not completely independent, but it does preserve a, a higher amount of diversity than you'd have otherwise. So what does this look like? This is an example. On the left hand side is that block of 10 uh, genes representing a father algorithm. On the right is the mother algorithm, and at the bottom right is the child algorithm. And so essentially what you're doing is you're combining different lines of the two top algorithms and producing a new algorithm at the bottom, which represents some new combination, some shuffling of that information from the top two. And the red uh, boxes that you see there represent genes that have been changed from the father algorithm. So in this case, five of the lines actually are changed 
compared to what the father had. Uh, some of these lines are the same as what the mother had. Some were also modified based on mutations. Those are the yellows. So I have a pretty high rate of mutation in these experiments because I want to keep introducing um, new information, and so this is the way I do it. So it's quite common for, for an algorithm to, to undergo a mutation from one generation to the next. And you can also, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but in these if-then statements, you'll see a lot of lines that are saying, if variable is greater than one, right? That's what I mentioned before as being a, a line that would never be executed. So anytime you see if variable is greater than one, that means that that's not actually being part of the solution. It's not executed. So there's a subset of those 10 lines that's actually being executed. There are also some lines in there you'll see that are saying if variable is less than or equal to one, that's always executed. That can never not be true. So that means that the rest of that block will always be executed. So that forms a baseline. So when you put all that together, you get solutions that look like this. So this is an actual temperature forecast equation based on this. I think it was a minimum temperature forecast equation for 60 hour forecast range. And really what it's saying, and it's, this is still normalized, it hasn't been, been uh, it's ranging from zero to one. So basically zero would represent the minimum that you could forecast and one would rec represent the absolute highest value that you would forecast. And so what this is really saying is that you have some combination of upstream observations, time of year, forecast cloud cover, model forecast temperature, model forecast wind speed. That combination forms the baseline for this minimum temperature forecast. And the weightings are out in front of it, so which ones it's weighting more than others. In this case, it's largely weighted on the model forecast temperatures. That's an important piece, but there's some modifiers to that. And then there's some additional conditionals that actually change that result depending on what else is going on. So for example, if there are windy conditions it, or if there's snow on the ground or if there's precipitation occurring, it's going to change the forecast from that baseline based on those conditions. Uh, I found also that this is a neat way of identifying biases in the model that I wasn't aware of before. It'll come out with an adjustment to the model forecast based on a bias that I didn't necessarily see. There was a case, I think, where strong, strong warm air advection patterns were associated with a warm bias in the, in the forecast model, and it actually accounted for that and started shaving that off of the forecast. So I would like to, to add, first of all, that all of the stuff that the evolutionary programs are doing is something that any analyst could do if you had essentially an infinite amount of time in which to do it, because you're looking for all of those partitions that you could separate out in the data. It's all in the data. And all this is really doing is, is an efficient way of mining that data and finding where those partitions really are. Now this is a figure that's going to take some explanation, so let me try. So basically I'm looking at four different models, if you will. They're all versions of the Lorenz 1963 equations, but truth is based on uh, an exact form of the equation, the models are all approximations to those equations, so the parameters are adjusted a little bit, essentially. And so model one is an actually a pretty poor model of the Lorenz equations. Model two is a somewhat better model. Model 2S is the same as model two, but it has stochastic physics, meaning I'm just perturbing the parameters around some, some baseline. Uh, and the nearly perfect one is a really good one, but not quite perfect. And these are set at two different forecast ranges. The top panel is a short forecast range. The bottom panel is a longer forecast range. The circles represent decreasing analysis error. So the large circle, large analysis error. The small circle, small analysis error. And so if you focus for a moment on the bottom panel and just look at the red circles, so over here, you'll see along this axis we have root mean square error. Along this axis, we have the, uh, the probabilistic skill score. And so where we want to be is up here. That's the best forecast. So the poor model at longer range is suffering a lot. It's not doing particularly well. What happens when you increase the precision of the analysis? It actually does improve root mean square error quite a bit, but the probabilistic forecast skill goes down. Why is that? It's because it's still much too sharp. There's too much agreement between the individual ensemble members, and so even though it's, it's reducing its root mean square error, it's pushing it over in the right direction, it doesn't have enough width to really capture what the actual observed value was, so the probabilistic forecast is actually not good. 
Uh, when there's more analysis uncertainty, there's more intrinsic variability in the forecast just because of that. So even though the root mean square error is poorer, the probabilistic forecast is better. And you see this at both uh, longer range and shorter range. And what's interesting about it is that you really start to only overcome that, especially at the longer ranges where the forecast signal is weaker, as the models start to improve beyond some acceptable model level, whatever that is. We don't know what it is, of course. But we see the same thing at both longer range and short range. It just happens more quickly in the shorter range forecasts. So there's this dichotomy, this tension between uh, deterministic forecast skill and probabilistic forecast skill in an imperfect environment, which is, of course, what we're actually dealing with. So we have to find the balance between those two in order to optimize our forecasts on both dimensions. So a lot of what I've been doing when I talked about diversity and managing diversity in the solutions is to try to maintain the ability to capture that probabilistic assessment while not sacrificing too much in terms of the deterministic forecast for mean square error. And here's an example of it in the evolutionary programs. So basically I'm comparing any two uh, evolutionary programs root mean square error on the training data set along the x-axis and the y-axis. So this is algorithm one, and this is algorithm two, and these represent the root mean square errors multiplied by 100. So this is 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the colors represent, the contours represent the root mean square difference between those two algorithms. So the, the blue colors represent not much difference. The red colors represent a lot of difference. And if you're over here, it's a poor forecast. If you're over here, it's a good forecast. So basically, what do we see? We see the, the better forecasts tend to agree a lot with each other. The not so good forecasts also tend to disagree with each other a lot. What we want is something sort of in here. So we have to optimize again, where we're not sacrificing much in the way of deterministic skill, but we're also capturing enough diversity that we can actually capture the, the real PDF that we're searching for. And here's an example of it from the real forecast data. And I'm comparing the evolutionary program ensemble. I believe this was a 2,000 member ensemble that I generated. It's a 60 hour forecast based, and the comparison forecast is the 21 member GFS MOS ensemble. So it's a post processed model output. It's already been presumably bias corrected through the MOS process. But what we see is, first of all, this is a highly anomalous event. This was in terms of standard deviations. The observed temperature was almost three full standard deviations warmer than normal, climatological normal. This is climatology, so we can see it's right at the tail end of the climatological distribution. Here's the GFS MOS ensemble distribution, and we can see it did one thing well. It's pushing it well up the scale in the right direction towards this highly anomalous state, but it doesn't go far enough. And furthermore, it's very sharp, so in actuality, there's a zero probability of it being where it actually was. So from a probabilistic verification standpoint, that's a terrible forecast. Even though from a deterministic forecast, it's actually pushing it in the right direction. So the error is smaller than, say, climatology, as far as the climatological forecast is concerned. Now, if we look at the evolutionary program ensemble, we see it's pushed a little farther in the right direction. And it's broad enough that it's actually capturing what the observed situation was. And that's fairly characteristic of uh, the cases that I've looked at. And that's why the, the uh, uh, Breyer skill scores for the evolutionary program ensembles are better than the MOS forecasts for the set of cases I've looked at. And I've looked at this, by the way, for minimum temperature forecasts all the way from 36 hours out to 156 hours. Uh, one of the reviewers on one of my papers suggested maybe you should try a more sophisticated calibration approach. And so I said, okay. So I started looking at the papers and thinking about Bayesian model averaging. And I also ran across something else called Bayesian model combination, which I haven't seen any or much discussion of in the meteorological literature. But it turns out it actually makes a lot more sense to me in terms of what we're trying to do. So Bayesian model averaging starts with the assumption that of your models, one of those represents the truth. So it's actually the truth. Uh, Bayesian model combination doesn't make any such assumption. It says we're looking for the best combination of models to get the best forecast. We don't care if any of them are the truth or if any of them uh, 
actually represent what the, the real state is. We just want the best combination of that information. And that's effectively what we're doing when we're doing ensemble forecasting, is we're trying to find, when we think about super ensembles or anything like that, we're basically trying to combine the forecast in the best way possible. So Bayesian model combination does that as part of the process. So I use that as a, as a calibration method. Now the downside of BNC is that I'm talking about ensemble sizes on the order of several thousand members. And uh, Bayesian model combination says, okay, if you have, let's say, four different weights for the models, and you have 10 models, then you have four to the 10th different combinations that you have to evaluate. That number works out to a little over a million, which is still very tractable for this. But when you get to four to the 15th or four to the 20th, it becomes impossible. So I'm only selecting 10 or 15 out of 2,000 me possible members. What's the best way to do that? I don't know. So I, I made some attempts at, at trying to maintain the uh, forecast skill from both deterministic and probabilistic sense, so to maintain the diversity while still minimizing the root mean square error for the training data set is a way of selecting those model members. But I really don't know if I'm selecting the best ones. And so there's some different ideas I want to try out as, about, as to better ways to do this. And the reason I'm showing this table is really to demonstrate that Bayesian model combination worked pretty well for the MOS forecast. So here's, here's the GFS using uh, Without any kind of additional correction, its root mean square error was 4.21. When you start using Bayesian model combination, you get it down to about 4. So it's a pretty significant improvement uh, just by applying that. And in particular, the probabilistic forecast increases a lot from 5.4% above climatology to about 9%. So it really does do a lot for the GFS which is kind of interesting because, you know, a MOS process, you think part of it is supposed to be to calibrate the forecast in some ways, but it doesn't appear to be going far enough in doing that. Um, for the evolutionary program, again, we're talking about 2,000 members. So the raw ensemble with just a really basic bias calibration does about as well as what you get when you use BMC with it. So the more sophisticated approach really didn't add a lot of value in either the um, root mean square error or the prior skill score, it's still fairly good, but you can see that the GFS begins to approach that level when you start doing a more sophisticated calibration. So it really helps a lot for the MOS ensemble. It doesn't help so much for the, uh, the EP, which I think is also interesting and something that I, I haven't fully understood yet. I need to think more about that issue as well. So another complicated graph, and this one is again the same two, two uh, verification states, root mean square error, and Breyer skill score. And basically what we want to see, these circles represent forecast range. So the big circles are longest forecast range, 156 hours for minimum temperature forecast, and 60 or 36 hours in the shortest range. And I want you to focus just on the red and the, I'm sorry, no, the green and the blue. So the green is the evolutionary program Bayesian model combination calibration, and the blue is the GFS. And basically what we see, comparing the green at 156 hours to the blue at 156 hours, that the uh, EP forecast is a little better in probabilistic skill and also in root mean square error. And that pattern persists throughout all the forecast ranges. Again, where you want to be is up here. And they're both progressing in the right direction. As you decrease forecast range, as you might expect, it improves. But there's, a, there's a, uh, an enhancement provided by the uh, evolutionary programs compared to the GFS, particularly at longer range. And what's interesting about this is that the separation between them in root mean square error increases with forecast range. So the suggestion is that the evolutionary program is maximizing whatever forecast signal is there and extracting that out much better than the uh, MOS ensemble is able to do at long range. Morris. Oh, you're supposed to get a microphone. This is your fault. Um, you suggested not looking at the red, and so I couldn't take my eyes <laughs> off the red circles. Um, would you like to? Ex could you explain what's going on? Sure. What this kind so, of strange. Okay. So the red, the red circle here is basically the base evolutionary program. So the EP with the Bayesian model combination is improving the probabilistic skill at 156 hours range. So when you look at the red 
compared to the green, that's what you're seeing there. So the, the root mean square error is roughly the same, but it's the probabilistic skill that was improved in that case. If you go to shorter range, you still see a little bit of that, but there's not much difference in the two. Yeah, okay, so this is, this is the outlier case, which is where your eye goes to automatically. Um, 132 hours, this is the base forecast. If you look for 132 hours in the GFS, is way over here. If you look for 132 hours in the, um, in the uh, Bayesian model combination, it's actually somewhere in here, I think. Yeah. 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 So, so what's happening there? I don't know for certain, but in looking at the data, it appeared to me that it's still very sensitive to the members of the sample, even though I have about, I think it was 1,000 samples for the test, it still is sensitive to a few really extreme outlier cases. And so because of that, this one did well on that one, so it actually reduced the error quite a bit compared to what the GFS was able to do. So I think that's what the story is there. This is <clears throat> an example of the use of weights in the evolutionary program, again, for the 60-hour minimum temperature forecast. And so to understand this diagram, these are all the different elements that are being used in the forecast. This represents the absolute value of the average weight. So it's the, it's the average absolute value of the weight for that particular parameter. The size of the circle represents the usage frequency in the algorithms. And then the color represents the variance of that usage. So for example, this red one here, what does this mean? This is basically, it's hard to see from this angle. That's the wind speed forecast. And so what it's showing is that there's a lot of weight attached to the wind speed elements in the forecast. And the red shows that there's a lot of diversity in the use of that weight across different evolutionary program algorithms. So some use it a lot, and some don't use it very much at all. But overall, it's used a lot in all of the different algorithms, which is why it, it has this big circle. Compare that, I mentioned earlier about snow, and you look over here and you say, well, what's this dinky little snow thing? You were talking about how important snow cover was. So why is it so small, and why is the weight so small? Well, the reason is because I'm only showing here the ones that are always executed. Remember, there were conditionals also. And where the snow appears is in the conditionals. It's a modifier in the conditional part, not in the baseline forecast. So it's not, so for example, most of the year, you don't care about snow cover. It's not there. So it's only when it does that you're trying to modify it. I also looked to try to do a relative weight analysis of, the, of a linear regression using the same set of forecasts, uh, data, and cues as with the uh, evolutionary program, just to see how weighting changed. And the bigger the bar essentially means the, the more weight is applied to that particular variable. So this is the NWP temperature forecast, which the, li the linear regression really mostly relies on throughout all the forecast ranges, up from the shortest range out to the longest range for the minimum temperature forecast. So it doesn't care too much about some of the other variables. It really only focuses on that one. Uh, whereas the evolutionary program, which is the red, has a really interesting structure. First of all, it's much more diverse in its use of the different information. And secondly, it changes its weighting over time. So in the early going, it's really a combination of model and observations and seasonality that make the forecast. As you go through the mid-range, it starts weighing the model a little bit more, but it's still attaching a lot of importance to those other elements. Towards the end, it's trending towards climatology. That's really what that's telling you, is that basically it's still attaching a little bit of weight to this other stuff, but it's mostly looking at climatology. It's d doing exactly what we were taught when we were forecasting, first learning forecasting. That, you know, as you go farther out, you're going to have to trend towards climatology, and that's what the EVP does. So it's nice to see it's actually behaving itself well without explicitly telling it to do that. I've also put together an adaptive form of this, and you might think, okay, what could be more adaptive than evolution, right? Uh, but it turned out that it took a little bit of thought to actually make it work in a way that uh, actually executed well. And the idea that I'm using, and I'll focus on here, is the one that works the best, which is what I call a mixed mode. And basically what it does is each forecast becomes a new generation. So you introduce new data, it trains on that new data using a moving window going back about a year or so. And so that the first day you introduce that new data, it's all old data except that one new day, and that's got new data. And it trains based on that, so that moving window starts incorporating more and more of that new data as it goes forward. New generations begin to see the value of that new data if it's better data, and it begins to rely on that. 
And that's the slow mode evolution, one forecast to the next, one step to the next, it does that. There's also a fast mode, and the fast mode is where I'm tweaking the coefficients. And I do that based on the previous seven days of forecast. I find the previous seven days, what coefficient structure actually provides the best deterministic and probabilistic forecast skill, and that's the one I use for the next day's forecast. So if you get a regime change, of course, it's not going to know anything about that, presumably, and it won't do well, but it adapts as you run through different types of regimes. Once that's established, it should do reasonably well. And I'm just showing this figure because this represents the color coding is the usage of different genes, which is on the left-hand axis. And this is after a fixed training using the GFS 60-hour uh, forecast data. And then I introduced the 36-hour forecast data as uh, verifying at the same time. So it's like you suddenly increased the skill of the, of the model forecast overnight. How would it incorporate that information? It's about half a degree, I think, or a little less than half a degree better in terms of root mean square error going from 60 hours to 36 hours. So basically you tell it, I've trained it on the 60-hour data. Now what happens when I give it the 36-hour data? What does it do? Well, these are the three algorithms that were used, or three genes that were used the most by the algorithms in the fixed training. And what happens as you start to introduce that new data is one of those three is retained at various levels of usage throughout the whole period, but the other two are abandoned and new forms develop. So you've got a, a new set of three, of which one is common with the other, and a bunch of other ones that go in and out, and they seem to be kind of seasonally oriented. So when you're in the middle of the summer, this batch comes out. When you're in the winter, this batch comes out. When you're in the next summer, a different batch comes out. So it's interesting to see how it's actually using the different information and adapting to it as you move through time. I also, uh, I won't go through this other than to say this is the adaptive EP using the 36-hour forecast data. This is the raw forecast skill, root mean square error of the 36-hour. So 3.73, so it's adding about 0.2 improvement to that. Um, the 60 hour is 4.3, so you can see it actually was a little bit more than 0.5 degree improvement. Um, and so we, we reduce the error and we actually make more out of it than what the, the raw data produces. So it's actually adapting. It turns out it adapts relatively quick. So there's a lot of lines on here because, you know, being a synoptic meteorologist, I'm not happy until you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. And so focus on the black line, which is the 36-hour GFS forecast data. This is a moving average root mean square error. And the blue line, which is the uh, adaptive EP ensemble. And basically, you can see that when you first introduce that new data, it's not doing as well as the 36-hour data because it doesn't know very much about it. It's only had a few cases. But within about 90 days, it starts crossing over that line. From that point on, for the most part, it's below the GFS 36 hour, and so it increases the skill in terms of root mean square error by about 0.2 over this whole period. You'll also notice there's a lot of variation in skill. We have good forecasts and bad forecasts, and that's just the way it is. And anyone who's ever done forecasting knows that. Some situations are easier to forecast than others. Some of that is seasonal, but some of it isn't also. Uh, another application that I just wanted to briefly mention is wind power. I'm working with um, a company in Wisconsin who provided me their wind, wind uh, farm data, both the energy produced and the individual turbine level measurements. So I've been after that data for many years, so it was great to actually get it so I could start to look at this. And I just wanted to show this to indicate so the wind speed is obviously the black line. You can see a lot of, this is just over a couple of days, and you can see a lot of higher frequency and lower frequency variability in the wind, as we all know. And you look at the wind power, which are the blue dots, and here it's pegged out at maximum, except for the dropouts that are occurring in the middle of it. So it's a pretty complicated process. Wind power is like the cubic of wind speed, so any small variations actually get amplified quite a bit when you're trying to forecast the wind power itself. One of the things I did was to actually look, take a careful look at the data itself, and I found that you could aggregate the five-minute data for a wind farm average power per turbine using the hourly wind, just an average over the hour, and get very good forecast, or not forecast, but just estimations using a cubic relationship. So you have about 1% of mean absolute error using 
uh, average data over an hour. So you don't really need to have all that high frequency data to get good forecasts if you could forecast the wind to that level of skill. What I also found is if you use, again, just observed data, but move off-site, not directly on-site, and do some sort of, try to do some kind of extrapolation of that off-site data to on-site, you lose a lot of information. So the error goes up from about 1% to about 10% just doing that. So again, it's not forecast data, it's observed data, but it's not good enough even at that level. So that's, that shows you, I think, you know, just the, the higher frequency and space and time elements that are important to doing something as complicated as wind power forecasting. Um, so I attempted to do it anyway, and what I found was that these were the primary variables that were important for the evolutionary programming, so some seasonal and diurnal issues, day of year, hour of the day, the forecast data for the 10 meter wind, which I then can extrapolate and also use powers. I'm using the reforecast 850 millibar wind speed as just a constant piece of information to input and getting some sense of whether there's a low level jet kind of structure there. It's not very good for that, as I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, and also an artificial neural network forecast that I derive from the same data just to provide a baseline forecast, which seems to add an additional element of predictive skill that the evolutionary program can latch onto and then improve upon. So it's kind of like a forecaster. You know, you, as a forecaster, when you get guidance, you look at the guidance and you say, okay, how can I fix it to make it a little bit better? And you'll see over the entire history of weather forecasting that weather forecasters actually add an increment of skill compared to the automated guidance. And it's the same with the evolutionary programs. They extract that additional piece beyond what the guidance is providing. So the ANN is like a guidance forecast. So here's like a, a cycle through a few days of the wind power. The green line represents the forecast wind power, the, the ensemble average wind power, and the very thin lines that you maybe can't even see at all from your seat represent the 12.5% uh, the and 87.5% uh, line, so you're basically looking at the 75th percentile interval across there. And the black dots represent the observed value. So the key thing here is that the ensemble brackets the observations about 73% of the time in the 75, 75th percentile. So it's actually pretty reliable in terms of that. And you'll see that there's a lot of fluctuation in the wind power. It's more or less falling along with that. Uh, the overall skill on that is is outperforming the artificial neural networks about 10.4 percent mean absolute error of nameplate capacity 11.7 for neural network 12.3 for multiple linear regression and 18.4 for persistence and in particular the gap is the largest for the over forecast cases and i think that's important because some of the information i've seen i think it depends a little bit on context but suggests that over forecasts are more expensive for wind farm operators than under forecast, unless I suppose you have really high capacity implementation. So if you've got 30% of your wind of your energy being provided by wind power, that might not hold anymore. But at least for most places, Wisconsin, we're like at 3% or something. So for Wisconsin, it'd certainly be more expensive if you have to spin up uh, new forms of power because you're forecasting a large amount of wind power and you didn't actually get it, or else they have to buy it from some short-term supplier at an elevated rate. So on the on the short-term market, it becomes very expensive for them to fill in that gap that they weren't expecting. So to have the better skill for the over-forecast cases, I think, is important. Now, obviously, there's a lot more work that's needed. Um, the interval spread averages about 33% of the capacity, ranging from 11% to 36%, which is still pretty wide. It varies depending on the forecast context, which you hope it would. So it's narrower when things look to be more predictable, and it's wider when it's less predictable. But that's still pretty wide. If you're an operator, and you're having to deal with that kind of uncertainty at the 75th percent level, you might not like that so much. So how can we reduce that is one issue. And the biggest errors I'm seeing are associated with the lower reaches of the low level jet. There's a nocturnal error bias. So I'm looking at ways that I might be able to improve that. For example, incorporating boundary layer model information into it might be helpful. Um, and there's some preliminary work I've been done with, doing with a simple boundary layer model that suggests that might be helpful, but I haven't gotten very far with that yet. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about, and just very briefly, I will cut immediately to the chase, is the heavy rainfall forecast. And I started off with the idea, okay, can we even do this at all? So the idea is if we have big rain events anywhere in this relatively large section of real estate, this is 
not all of the state of Wisconsin, but a lot of it. This is not all of the state of Illinois, but a lot of it. So within this range, if there is reported uh, rainfall in excess of an inch, an inch and a half, or two inches, I'm trying to make probabilistic forecasts of that happening somewhere within this area. And I'm finding that compared to a uh, multiple logistic regression forecast, which is LR, uh, by the way, if you don't know this diagram, shameless self-plug, this is my performance diagram that I invented several years ago. And what's nice about it is you have all these elements of dichotomous forecasts in the same figure. So success ratio is one minus false alarm ratio. So you get false alarms on this one. Probability of detection is your hit rate. Uh, the bias, you want to be on this diagonal. This is, this is uh, bias equals one, which is perfect. So you want to be up here in this diagram. This is a perfect forecast. And as you go on this line, that's a higher bias, over forecast bias. On these lines, it's an under forecast bias. These curved lines are the threat score, the CSI. So as you go up this way, and so you can very quickly see the uh, problem if you improve, improve probability of detection at the expense of false alarm, what you find is you don't improve your skill at all, you just move where you are, so you move along this line. So it's a nice way of visualizing that also. So anyway, the performance for these, this preliminary study at one inch was about the same actually for the evolutionary programs as for the logistic regression model that I produced. So they're both executing at a relatively good level within that large area. The probability of detection is quite high, over 90%, <clears throat> and false alarms are you know, around 30%. So it's not too bad. As you increase the category up to two inches, what you find is the logistic regression is drastically reducing its probability of detection. It's also increasing its false alarms, so it falls down here. Same thing happens to the EP, but not nearly as much in either category. And so as a consequence, its skill is actually quite a bit higher now compared to logistic regression. Again, this is consistent with what I've been finding, that at the extremes of the forecast is where it seems to extract more skill. When you're talking about longer range forecasts, where the signal seems to be somewhat weaker, it actually is extract, extracting whatever is there and able to get the maximum out of it. And I'm seeing the same again with the precipitation data. So that's kind of interesting. Now, the key issue is how small can we go before we lose any hope at all of predicting anything? And I don't know the answer to that. And one of the limitations in this kind of study is having good precipitation data for a long enough period to actually be able to do that. So I'm using the uh, unified precipitation data set, which basically goes back uh, a fairly long time period. And you can resolve these kinds of events in that data. And now I need a forecast model that also goes that far back. I'm using the reforecast model version 2 to do that. The reforecast model version 2 doesn't capture these kinds of events, but it captures the synoptic setting in which those events take place. And that information is very valuable for the forecast. So you can still extract value out of the reforecast by using it that way. And uh, this is the probabilistic skills. So again, at 2 inch, we're about 25% above climatology. The reforecast is negative as it is for the one inch also. We don't care about that. What we care about is the synoptic information, not, not the precipitation forecast. We wouldn't expect the reforecast with that coarse resolution to be able to resolve all of those details. I also did a, a Bayesian model combination. For this, it actually improved the probabilistic skill quite a bit more. So it's now up to about 33%, which seems pretty good for a two inch forecast. And just out of uh, interest for those who are synoptically oriented, what were the uh, weights that were strongest in the evolutionary program. CAPE, higher values of CAPE lead to higher probabilities of heavy rainfall. Higher values of precip precipitable water anomalies with respect to climatology lead to higher rainfall events. Forecasters know about this, and that's actually why I'm using it, because I heard them talk about it and said, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to use it. So I put it in there. Uh, and deep layer shear has a negative influence, because again, if you have fast flow, the storms can't hang around as long as so they move through the area and they can't accumulate the precipitation. So all of these make logical sense from a forecast perspective. And you can interpret the logic in the program because I set it up so that you could do that. So at the risk of making a monkey out of Darwin, I'm going to continue this work. <coughs> and uh, the issues that I'm looking at, again, are enhancing diversity. Um, like I mentioned before, increasing the population size diversifying training experiences of individuals to see if that will help to increase diversity, looking at the optimization of the Bayesian model combination approach 
How do you subselect members out of several thousand to get a, a subset that's order 10? How can you do that? Maybe I should just give up and not do that at all. That's another alternative. Um, this gap between the Breyer skill score changes and the root mean square <coughs> error, where it increases with forecast range for root mean square error, but doesn't really seem to do that so much with Breyer skill score. Is that a sampling issue? Is there something else going on here? I don't know. Um, the adaptive thing, I want to get into spatial forecasting a little bit more. This is all point forecasts. It would be nice to be able to do something with regimes, for example, regime-based training <coughs> intervals. When I talked previously about the seven-day uh, training for the fast mode coefficients for the adaptive mode, why seven days? Because some of the research out there suggests that's optimal, and the data I had also seemed to suggest that. But it may vary. In fact, it probably does vary depending on what kind of regime you're in. So if you have faster jets, for example, it may be the, that you need a shorter interval, and slower jets, a longer <coughs> interval might work. So those kinds of things. And lastly, the heavy rainfall. This is how small I am so far, which is not very small, but perhaps we can go smaller. As you start to subdivide that area that I showed you, you then shorten your number of samples because you're already, if you cut it into quarters, you presumably have only a quarter of the events that you had before when you looked at the whole area, if everything was uniformly distributed. So you have fewer and fewer samples. That becomes a problem when you're doing training. So what does the future hold? I like to show this because this is kind of the, the generalized view that a lot of people have that as you start getting into more and more automation, this is where we were when we were kings of the world and we were maximal use of our tools for forecasting. And now the poor forecaster is hunched down over the computer and now has become a tool of the tools. And I would say that's wrong. That's not the way it's going to work. That the, these are just better forms of guidance. And when I run, a, I've run a forecast service at UW-Milwaukee for clients who pay good money to get the forecast. And what they are concerned about is weather decision support. They don't care about a specific number. They want to know about what is the weather going to do in the context in which they're operating their business. And so guidance is just going to help the forecaster actually leverage the information they have in better ways than they can do if the guidance isn't as good. So it's not like it's going to replace the forecaster. In the best circumstances, it will actually help them to do a better job. And I think that's where, where the forecast enterprise is really going, is weather decision support. And I know the National Weather Service talks a lot about that these days, too. So with that, I will stop. And if you have any interest, questions will be happily answered. Thank you. So we, we are recording, so if you have a question, if you can use the mic. you have any questions, Luca? I guess I have a couple of questions. The first one, um, is that correct that you're applying your algorit algorithm independently by location and possibly lead time? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by independently. <clears throat> you're running the genetic algorithm every time from scratch when you change location, when you change lead time. Oh, okay, so for training. Yeah. Yeah, so a another restriction on this is that each area is not going to be identical. So if I train for Chicago, let's say, that's right. and then I want to apply it for Minneapolis, it's like Moss, you know, you have to that's train right. it. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same kind of problem there. So that's the way you approach it. Yeah. And what is the typical computational time required to retrain the algorithm okay. for, for a given forecast? So that's a good question. Obviously, it depends on what the initial population is. I've been using routinely 10,000 members. And when I do that, I do it on a laptop. It's that fast. So it really doesn't take a lot of time. I said it. On a laptop for one location. Right, right. So, you know, 50, 50 um, training steps, 50 to 100 training steps will usually give you a really good solution for that one location. And that can be done on a not particularly fast laptop. I use the, uh, I'm forgetting what, which one it is, but it's not a fast processor. And it, it does that in 30 minutes or less. 30 minutes. Yeah. Now, when you. When you actually run the forecast, that's instant because it's just like a, a MOS equation. So, boom, it's out. In 2000, it's still instant. It doesn't take any time at all. Any other questions? I noticed in uh, most of your comparisons, the you're you're comparing your your model against uh, like a linear regression or a or a logistic regression with the exception of the one neural network, of course. Uh, I was wondering if you com have compared it against any other ensemble 
uh, machine learning methods, uh, either ensembles of linear regressions or or something like a random forest, and see how it compares with them. Because I, I suspect there may be some ways where it could do better, uh, especially on the extreme end. Right. Um, that's that's an interesting point, and I think in terms of diversity, that's a that's a good point. In introducing different kinds of approaches, to like a multi-model ensemble approach, it's the same kind of thing. And in fact, I wanted to go back to this to kind of address that. This table, I didn't talk about this, but the bottom line represents a mixture. Instead of having 10 members being derived from the uh, evolutionary program ensembles, I had five that were selected from the evolutionary program, four that came from the GFS MOS ensemble, and one that was a multiple linear regression. And that actually did better than any of the others. So I think there's reason to believe that that kind of approach would be pretty effective. Any other questions? I have one serious question and one not so serious <laughs> question. Um, the serious we'll, we'll question. We'll take up the non-serious one at CG five, right? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, the, the serious question is, um, it, of course, this depends on having some insight and in which parameters to put into the algorithms initially, right? Um, have you done any sensitivities to, you know, the range of different, you know, what kinds of different parameters, like for minimum temperature? work well and don't work well? Or? Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that's, that's interesting about forecasting is that there are a lot of different pieces of information that different forecasters will rely on, but they're essentially equivalent. And I did some studies a number of years ago where some people, for example, like to look at precipitable water, and other people like to look at surface dew point, but you, actually they correlate very highly. So there's not really a lot of additional information content in one versus the other. So some of that's just a matter of preference. But there are other elements I don't know necessarily. I, I feel like in some of the forecasting that I've done, I have a reasonable amount of domain expertise, and I have a pretty good idea of what needs to be in there. But I don't know everything, and not all the research has been done, so there probably will be new things that will come out that, that people hadn't realized were as important as they turn out to be. So the long answer is I don't really have a good sense of what that is. I do know that if you just keep throwing stuff in, for the sake of throwing it in, because you think, oh, maybe it'll help. Eventually, you run into a wall because you have limited training data, and you can't explore that solution space effectively. So it basically gets distracted by that other information. Do I have time for a non-serious question? Absolutely. Unless somebody else has a serious question. In the um, evolution of the population, have you considered the possibility of a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the death I was talking about, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it comes back to life. Oh. It's a living dead. Oh, okay. Well, you know, actually, I do have zombies. Seriously, they, they do they do come out. Um, because Because what happens is, even though you eliminate the algorithms that don't meet the threshold, if it turns out, that none of the uh, none of the uh, ecological niches are performing up to snuff after you do that, then I back off the criteria a little bit. So the ones that were killed, some of them then come back to life. <laughs> it was a more serious question than I thought. <laughs> Any other questions? Just uh, wondering, have you tested this in data void regions and in sparsely populated observation regions? Um, <clears throat> no, and my guess, my, my initial hypothesis was when you started doing longer range forecasts where the signal was weak, you wouldn't be able to do very well. And at least on an absolute scale, that's true. Of course, your forecast skill diminishes as forecast range increases. So my guess is the same thing would happen with data sparse regions, you wouldn't perform as well, but you might extract more value there than you can with some other methods. Any other questions? Well, thanks, Paul. That's very Thank interesting. You.